I'm trying to cut through the hype and just get down to business. This is really a story about the technology that's going into this card and uh, mostly the software uh, and just a lot of the stuff they've done uh, behind the scenes. Because really, when you move from Maxwell to Pascal, yes, you're going down to 16 nanometer uh, as far as the FinFET process and that sort of thing goes. And yes, you're getting uh, much faster clock speeds, but really there's not an extreme amount that's changed in the architecture other than the fact that they've shrunken things down. Now it's got 180 uh, watt TDP, which is nice. Uh, only needs one eight pin power connector, which is also very nice. All right, so we have 2560 CUDA cores, base clock of 1607. The boost clock is up at 1733. We have a 256 bit uh, memory interface. Memory bandwidth is 320 gigabytes per second. Memory speed is 10 gigabits per second. And uh, we have eight gigabytes of Micron's new GDDR5X. It's extremely fast, and that's one of the things they actually had to change on the PCB, was they had to really be careful about how to lay out the PCB, and they had to read some, redo some of their traces and everything, because this memory is so freaking fast. All right, as far as the uh, dimensions and everything goes, it's 4.376 inches tall by 10.5 inches long, and it's a two-slot card. There is a backplate on this, and the backplate's gonna add a little bit of rigidity. Some people say that it's going to help to I don't know, dissipate some heat. That's very negligible. But one thing that they did, um, you know, the, the the original 980s had the backplate and they took them off because they were a little bit thick and they were causing some issues in, you know, uh, close SLI configurations. Well, here they've made it a little bit thinner, so it's a low profile. And they've also, uh, the front part of the backplate has a large area that's removable so that you can install aftermarket cooling, water cooling, or just, you know, have a little bit of fun with some modding and that sort of thing. Let's talk about the ports on this card. So we have DisplayPort 1.4. It's not 1.2, not 1.2, not 1.3, 1.4. And that means we're gonna get um, 4K at 120 hertz, 5K at 60 hertz, and then you can even do 8K um, at 60 hertz with two uh, of the DisplayPort cables. So that's really cool. We also have HDMI 1. Point, I'm sorry, 2.0B. Then we also have dual-link DVI. Now one thing that's interesting about the, uh, the HDMI and also the, the new DisplayPort. These also support HDR, so you can be sending an HDR signal to whatever can use it. That's interesting. They also have the Shield. It's a streaming device. The Shield will decode the HDR, and this card will encode and decode it on the fly. So it can send um, HDR to your Shield, and then you can stream HDR to your HDR TV or other connected device. Okay, another thing we need to clear up is the Founders Edition. Some people are kind of confused as to what this is. Well. It's the reference design. Now, the reference design was never like an official NVIDIA thing. The Founders Edition here is it's more expensive because it's fancier. They decided they wanted to make their own card fancy. It's their prerogative. They can do it. It has die cast uh, aluminum. Aluminium, everyone in the UK and uh, other parts of the world that care about uh, semantics. And, uh, you know, it's got the nice back plate. Inside we have uh, the, the blower fan and a bunch of heat fins. And we have a vapor chamber cooling system in here to keep things nice and cool. And then on the back, as you notice um, where I, I guess uh, all the ports and everything are, the holes there are huge. They're not like the normal slots. You see those little slots? Well, if you see those on a card, those things are not the best when it comes to dissipating heat because they don't, don't let enough heat out. And these nice big holes, they let a lot of air out and that can actually um, that can actually really improve the thermals. There's a lot of really cool technology going on here. We talked about um, most of this in one of our episodes of The Tech. You guys should go watch that right now. The link is on the screen right about here. It's right here. And uh, there's lots of other technology going on that make this uh, a bit different. Rendering the geometry in one pass instead of two for VR really makes VR... Uh, this is like the card for VR. So, yeah. Let's talk about SLI for a minute, because there's a few different ways you can do SLI with DirectX 12 and Vulkan and some of the newer APIs. You can throw them all in the system, and the system can just see it as one big pool of happy rendering power. So you can even mix an, an NVIDIA card with an AMD card, and that, that kind of stuff is going to be possible. NVIDIA still prefers to do it the old school way, or their way. Uh, I don't want to say old school because they've made some improvements over the years. And there's something a little different now, because they still want you to use the bridge on top. Whereas you've seen AMD, they just pop the cards in there and it does the transfers to the bus. That can do uh, a little bit as far as negative impact goes for the frame uh, latency. But uh, what NVIDIA is doing now with this card is they are trying to send even more through the bridge. So they're going to make you buy a more expensive bridge. Unless you already have one of the hard body bridges, some of those might work. But it is a essentially, they say, a double bandwidth bridge or high HB, uh, HB whatever, high bandwidth bridge. 
uh, but it's one of the hard bridges. The little floppy, flimsy ribbon bridges are not going to work anymore for SLI on this card, but it will give you a smoother gameplay experience with better frame times and less latency. All right, let's talk about some more improvements in the software because uh, really the overall speed you guys will see in the games is not that crazy uh, when you compare it to like a 980 Ti. It's, th their marketing stuff was a bit over the top, but in the future, uh, some of the things that they've implemented into this could really help. Asynchronous compute, what they've got, you know, like normally you have like all your different CUDA cores or whatever your processors and some of them are doing physics and some of them are doing graphics. Well, with this one, uh, the, way, the way that works is if one of them finishes, like the say the physics finishes first, they have to wait until the graphics is finished doing their thing before it's before the whole entire scene is done. So it, it slows down the FPS a little bit. With this one, as soon as one job is finished, whether it's the, maybe the physics gets finished first and we're still rendering the shaders or whatever, well, those extra cores are going to immediately start rendering all the other stuff. So there's no downtime and everything just keeps working all the time. Now, one of the things that I'm most excited about is GPU Boost 3.0, and that's one of the reasons I can push this card so far. With GPU, GPU Boost 2.0, there's a linear, well, it's not really a curve, but this is like a linear graph as far as the voltage and the frequency go. They go up in a linear fashion. Whereas this one, well, it's a nice organic curve. So the frequency offset is gonna be sort of dynamic. Sometimes you can get a little more at certain voltages and sometimes a little less. So it's not just locked together, the voltage and the frequency. Normally you can go in manually and do this kind of overclocking. But with this, you can go in and set, you know, um, say you want this voltage and this temperature. And those are your thresholds. You set them up right there and you just say, I don't want to go higher than that. And then it can actually go in and play around and say, okay, well, here's the curve that we've generated for you. Essentially doing your job for you and saying, hey, you just found 200 extra megahertz just, just lying around They're right here. Now you can run it, you know, 1900, 2000 megahertz. Pretty cool. The overclocking tools that we had were like in developer mode. So we didn't get to play around with a lot of stuff. So when we get more mature versions, we might do some overclocking tutorials for you guys. Another really cool technology uh, that they're throwing into this card is something called Fast Sync. So you have your V-Sync, right? That uh, says that your refresh rate on your monitor is here. And when your game goes higher than that, you get some screen tearing. That's where the screen does this sort of thing, like half of the screen renders first, and then it displays that. And the other half of the screen renders second, and it displays that. And so you get these lines in the screen. You don't want that. Then with G-Sync, it will lock the, uh, ref it'll lock the refresh rate on your monitor to the FPS in your game. And that's the smoothest, best experience still. But that only goes to, you know, usually like 120, maybe 144 hertz, depending on the monitor and the implementation of G-Sync. This comes in for you guys out there running games like, you know, CSGO and whatever that can get 200, 250 FPS. You're way above, but you don't want to lock it down. You don't want to lock it to G-Sync or you don't want to lock it to V-Sync. At all, and you know, maybe maybe there'll be some stuttering. You just won't get the full performance. Fast Sync allows you to run your game at as high of an FPS as you want. You can run it at 3,000 FPS if you want to. Then there are three buffers working together. You got that for buffer, lower buffer, and then your standard frame buffer, whatever. Uh, forget all the details, but anyway, they work together to pick out the exact frames that it's going to show you. So even though you're running, you're kind of wasting a little bit of energy, but you know, you're still able to run the game at full fluidity, really fast, and then the game will just display as many frames as your monitor can show you, and the buffers decide on the fly which frames you're going to see, but you're still running at a super high FPS instead of locking it to the refresh rate of your monitor like VSync. It's sort of a nice way around uh, the problem of, my card's just too fast, man. What am I gonna do, it's too fucking fast. And we talked about Ansel a lot in um, our video, you know, our, our, our episode of the tech, from the NVIDIA event. You guys should go watch that. Ansel, I'll give you guys the, the, the quick version. It hooks the camera in the game, allows you to become a photographer in the game, and then takes extremely high resolution shots. We're talking like 30, 40K shots because it takes the screen and just takes, you know, a 4K shot of every little square of the screen. So you can have a tiny monitor, 1080p or whatever, and still be able to take 30, 40K ginormous shots, and then you can color grade them and add filters from the community and do all sorts of things like that. One of the main reasons to get this card is VR. They've put a lot of work into VR, um, and I'm not really going to get into the details of VR because I don't have a VR headset right now and couldn't test any of this out, but they have done a lot for VR. They've done some things to correct some of the weird distortions around the edges. They've, you know, actually pre-warped images for you. Uh, they, they're rendering the geometry in one pass for both eyes instead of one pass for each eye, essentially almost doubling your performance. It's This is where it really, really has an advantage over a Titan X or, a, you know, a 980 Ti or 
uh, 980 or something like that. Now, as far as the temperatures and the acoustics go, I decided to leave this on auto to see what it would do. Um, and it kept it really quiet. I was surprised. Usually, the you know, these blower fans, uh, they get a little loud. Um, and just sitting at your desk, and I've got the computer in the floor, Paul. What are you going to do about it? My computer's in the floor. Um, anyway, so I've got the computer in the floor. Sitting at the desk, I could barely even notice a difference. If you have headphones on, you're not going to notice this at all. So it's a very quiet card thanks to the vapor chamber. And just the fact that it's, you know, a, a 16 nanometer card, it's not going to get quite as hot. Now, with an overclock, um, which I did on all the benchmarks, we overclocked it by 200 megahertz for all the benchmarks because it's so easy. You just go in and say, hey, 200 megahertz and give me like 105 or 106 percent on the power profile. Done. It's it, sure you can have it. 200 extra megahertz are free. Um, and with that, it was running in the mid to high 80s, 86, 87 degrees Celsius. Now the threshold on this, it's getting kind of close to the thresholds, up 94, 95 is the threshold. You don't want to get any hotter than that with this card, but still under the threshold, never went above it. And you can actually turn up the fan if you want to. You're going to increase a little bit more noise, but I'm kind of comfortable at it running in the 80s. I'd prefer to run the you know, 60s or 70s, of course, but uh, I'm one of those weirdos who will trade off a little extra heat for you know lower noise. We know this card's amazing for VR, but how is it for desktop gaming? Go ahead and click on the next video and you can see this card against the 980 Ti. I also tried out some indie games, some of my favorites, and my copy of very, very modded Skyrim. So go ahead and check that video out. And at the end of that video, I'll tell you exactly what I think of the price to performance ratio of this card. So go ahead and click and see if it lives up to the hype. I'll see you in the next video. Actually, the actually, the